Hi, my name is Akalan, or by our cell, you have to have the money, the beast, on your mind, or in your hand. One of the words, they don't translate correctly. That's what this 666 is all about. You know, I'm not that big of a Bible thumper, but you can see they don't translate this word correctly. And the whole context has to do with buying and selling. And um, it's not the mark, it's the money of the beast on your mind or in your hand. And there's the unabridged Greek-English lexicon showing you the word kragma means the impress on the coin, or and hence stamped money coin. And these people, like, I mean, you know, words change over time, and so they put like here that this was popular in the 3rd century A.D. here, or 4th century, and uh, things like that on there the 5th, 6th century. But Antipater Thessalonius was, let's see here, the 1st century. So the kerygma means the impress on the coin, and in 66 AD the Jews revolted against the Roman Empire and started coining their own money, which was about the same time this book of Revelations was written. And so, like, the Revelations was probably plagiarized by early Christians who added stuff about Jesus at the beginning and the end. And there's a book called, uh, oh, what is it? Uh, something about the Apocalypse where um, this guy believes that it was originally a Hebrew book, you know, just like I do. That, And then they, you know, like, the problem with this Christianity is not really what Jesus said. In fact, you know, Jesus was a radical and told his disciples to go forth without money and uh, said, you can't serve God or money. Another one of those words, they don't translate correctly. It's a Aramaic word, mammon. And um, if you look up, um, I put, I got this on the Wikipedia. So if you look up the word mammon, you can see the etymology that it, it's actually a, a Hebrew word that means money or wealth. And um, so um, the whole context in Luke 16 here is the, the um, well, this is it, you, you know, when money is a thing of the past. And because, uh, you know, the money is always back then and even today it becomes worthless. You know, the Germans were carrying wheelbarrows full of money you know, this funny money paper stuff. And it's happened throughout history. So Jesus says, um, you can't serve two masters. You'll either hate the first and love the second, or you will be devoted to the first and think nothing the second. You cannot serve God and money. And uh, they uh, don't translate that. They'll say God and mammon, and they'll make you think it's some stupid God they worship back then. But and then, like later in Luke, they, the the thirteenth and fourteenth uh, verses, it says that the Pharisees, who loved money, heard all this and scoffed. It's like you know, in the same chapter, in the same context. I, I should have put some dots in here and ran it all together, but uh, you know, I've done. I wrote this so long ago, and there he's telling his disciples to carry nothing in your purse. So, like, you know, Jesus was a crazy radical and, uh, you know, upset the tables of the money changers, and that's what we need to do today. And there's, like, this pitch fest. You're supposed to pitch your idea for a movie to these people that are in the industry, and they'll, they'll tell you, I think it's basically, they're not going to tell you how good you're concept is maybe they'll just but they rate you on how well you tell the story and maybe they will say oh wow that's just such an interesting story i, I know somebody will like it you know but i wasn't um like uh up to it you know i've got all these other crazy things going on and trying to get out of babylon the summer's going to be here before you know it and it's just like um so hot here like up in you know the Midwest and Wyoming and Northeast, it's freezing cold, but down here in Tucson, we've been having, it seems to me, unusually warm uh, winter. <clears throat> There's no snow in the mountains. We have a dumb ski lodge up here that really hasn't been able to open 
very much and for the past five or six years and uh, so like you pitch these movies to these people and my idea would be this messiah coming back today and and having a all-star cast of characters like like um, Al Gore for to explain the terrible situation with the climate and um, there's this article in the front page of the New York Times like my last show was in December so I've been saving newspapers. I have one sh new show every uh, two weeks now, or two months. <laughs> and so my last show was, uh, was it in November, December, January? Anyway, um, you can see how the, <clears throat> the earth is warmed. And uh, I went looking up, um, this is what, 1960 over here. And... Uh, and then it's hard to tell if it's progressing, well, you know, geometrically or what, you know, like how quick, I mean, the population grows at a certain certain rate, and so does our energy consumption. So it's hard to tell, you know, I went on the Internet to try to find some, some projections for, you know, like what will it be in uh, the year, um, you know, 2100, or even 2030, you know, uh, if and they're saying if it goes up, uh, I don't remember if it's two degrees centigrade or um, or two degrees Fahrenheit, but uh, then you know it's going to be be even worse. And you can like up here in in the Bering Straits, it looks like there the temperature is like 7.2 degrees above Fahrenheit, and so things are just uh, getting out of hand, and Al Gore would be one of the 12 disciples on my idea for a movie, you know, and I'd like to pitch it to Mel Gibson. I'd like him to be the um, director for this movie, you know, it'll be like an, uh, the Messiah coming back, you know, and he, the, he or she or whatever is going to, you know, go on to Wall Street where the money changers are, and like, like, um, Abby Hoffman did, or was it Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin? They had a bunch of money, and they back then you could just walk right up onto the balcony of the stock exchange, and you could spit on these guys down below if you wanted. And so um, Jerry Rubin and Abby Hoffman got this whole bunch of money, and they threw it over the wall and the fence or the barrier there, and onto the off the balcony, and. And the stop, they stopped the stock exchange. I should figure out what day that was and and look at some of the articles about it. But you know, so that's what the Messiah would do. Would that's where you know Babylon it had these ziggurats, these tall buildings where they'd go to the top. And well, they had it down in uh, the Mayas had these pyramids and did the same kind of thing. These sacrifices and they. Um, the ziggurat, you know, it's not like a pyramid, like the, where they buried somebody, but uh, they uh, they worship the money there uh, five days a week, and and um, you know the World Trade Center was uh, down there, and it was kind of symbolic. That building, I've heard, it was like uh, it, the asbestos was crumbling or something like that. You know, they used to wrap asbestos around pipes and. I, th I think, did they build that in the 70s? Because that's when they bas they pretty much stopped doing that. And because uh, it was so bad, you know, this asbestos. And so there was really no way to, and I just, I don't know. I mean, I, I wonder what the air levels of asbestos were and if they're telling the truth, you know. Like a lot of these guys that were cleaning up down there uh, at Ground Zero got, got like terrible kinds of, diseases, cancers, and I don't know how many of them got that asbestos disease, but uh, they had a lot of different diseases, and that, that pit was there, it was just kept radiating heat. They, they were, people had witnessed, like they said, channels of ore, melted molten steel melting, going down through some kind of a drain or something, you know, these firemen who went in there. And uh, 
So, uh, you know, when I first heard about those Twin Towers coming down, I, I didn't believe they, you know, I figured you know, when an airplane went in, the pop, top part would fall over maybe at the most, you know, because these buildings are made to withstand an airplane crashing into them. The, you know, they had one crash into um, the Empire State Building, and it didn't crash. They, they didn't make the building fall down, you know. They built these strong enough. I mean, like, there's a lot of fog around New York City, and they have a whole bunch of airplanes flying around up there, you know, and and that's exactly what happened. They had, I think it was a, I don't, I, was it a B-52 smashed into the Empire State Building and it, it didn't crash. And, uh, you know, no, high, no high-rise building of uh, steel frames has ever, have ever, has ever um, totally uh, been destroyed in a fire like that. There wasn't any fire up there either. And the, the main um, uh, structures I- inside the Twin Towers was in the core, it was in the center. And you can see that, you know, those airplanes didn't go in there they, and the fires were, were going out, all that black smoke. That's not the Twin Towers, but, you know, it's a, it was a tower in Madrid that um, the Windsor Building in Madrid that burned all night. And there's a lot of pictures about this, you know. And on my website, I've got a video of a building being destroyed just like the Twin Towers with dynamite, you know, or whatever they use. They had a more sophisticated kind of a weapon, and I tried to figure out what it was, if it was like a thermobaric bomb, or some of these people are spreading disinformation saying that it was a uranium, a nu- mini nuke or something. And then there's even more people, there's this woman that thinks that they used some kind of a laser or I mean, so, you know, there. this guy, um, uh, what's his name, he came out with this thing called cognitive, uh, not cognitive dissidence, but uh, cognitive infiltration, and uh, he wrote this report, and I don't know if it was an official government report or one of these, uh, like uh, the report that they, the neocons used to start these wars in the Middle East, uh, American progress or something like that. But this report was um, about um, this guy that um, believed that the government should infiltrate like, like uh, and pr- produce disinformation, especially in regards to 9-11. You know, because like I said, intuition or logic told me that, you know, if an airplane crashes into a building, it's not going to come straight down and, and be pulverized and have inches of dust all over Lower Manhattan, and not have any desks or telephones or or glass or anything left except rusty, melted, twisted, bent steel girders. And some of these girders, like, were ejected and and like smashed into buildings next door and stuff. And you know, it was all neatly already pre-cut, and so they just hauled it off to China and made landfills out of it or something, you know. So the Chinese know our secret that, you know, we started this, um, we started these Middle East wars in order to, like, steal the oil from them and and things like that. And so then that same day at around 5 o'clock in the afternoon, 5.30 maybe, this World Trade Center building number 7 came crashing down, uh, just like a controlled demolition. And very few people know this that there was three buildings in New York City that came crumbling down. And inside this um, World Trade Center building number seven, there were like a lot of government agencies that were investigating certain stock frauds and things like that down there. I mean, that was really a convenient target. And maybe one of those um, airplanes, that one that crashed in Pennsylvania, was supposed to go in there. I don't think so. I think it was going to go into, well, they don't, I mean, I don't know. I mean, why didn't they get the one that went in the Pentagon? I mean, that was, you know, the most, we're supposed to have, it's a joke. I mean, you know, uh, if our Army and Air Force is that bad that um, somebody could hijack an airplane and crash it in there without, like, some kind of uh, rendezvous, you know, like they chase all these people through the city streets, you know, for, like, they did with um, that guy, um, O.J. Simpson, and... And, um, you know, why didn't they go after this hijacked airplane? And 
there's a video of, um, it's called Cheney in the Bunker, because Dick Cheney was down in the bunker, and uh, Leon Panetta kept, he was, I don't know, some kind of, I don't remember what his position was, but he was somehow appointed to some prominent position to be next to Dick Cheney in the bunker. And so um, he kept coming in here. He went in there to see Dick Cheney and said to him, uh, hey, there's an airplane coming in. Aren't we going to intercept it? And uh, I can't remember. you got to look it up. It's called uh, Cheney in the Bunker. There's a song about it, but um, there's also a video. And Leon Panetta testified at the 9-11 Commission. You get Google Leon Panetta 9-11 Commission, and you'll see him telling you this story. He'll say, yes, I kept asking, uh, oh no, Mr. Cheney kept asking, how far away is the airplane? And this guy kept coming in, telling him it's five minutes away, it's or 10 minutes away, or 15 minutes away, or whatever he said. And he kept coming in, and they were wondering, well, why aren't we going to intercept this? And and so, like, that plane, or it wasn't even a plane, because there was, it, you can see the ejection hole there. It, whatever crashed in there it was probably like a cruise missile or something, because the wings would have damaged the facade, but and the jet engines would have damaged the facade, but, but there was no evidence. Even one of the news reporters said that there's no evidence of a plane crashing in there. And then after a while, the the building collapsed, you know, and then that des that destroyed the entry. But there's an exit. Of it. It's a nice, perfectly round hole. And it's very strange what could have done that. There wasn't any giant engine sitting there that flew through all those rings of the Pentagon. But that section that was hit was allegedly the place where they had the uh, Pentagon budget, you know. So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, they didn't really investigate this 9-11 thing. Remember, they wanted to appoint Henry Kissinger first to be on uh, the 9-11 commission. And then everybody said, oh, no, you can't have that. You know, I mean, Henry Kissinger was a big liar involved in, you know, the Vietnam War. They lied about this Tonkin Gulf thing over there. It was a false flag or a setup, whatever, you know. And uh, it's um, that's how all these wars get started. It's the you know they lied about the weapons of mass destruction and and then they did this 9/11 thing, the, this um, project for a new American century by these neocons. And uh, they had an article where they um, said that we need to have a new Pearl Harbor to uh, start another war in the Middle East. And you know it's like you know we've really really destroyed their country over there. It's like there's so many refugees out in, uh, you know, Af all over. You know, Syria, a lot of the refugees started because um, they had a drought there. And uh, this guy visited Iraq five times. In uh, four years, Syria's population uprooted. Two million people have fled. And, uh, and he goes over here with... 151 million refugees, asylum seekers, or displaced people worldwide, more than at any time in the organization's history. You know, it's like, wow, 50 million. And here's what else it's causing in Afghanistan. You know, it's like after we lost the Golden Triangle in Burma and the four corners of the, the Golden Triangle there, they uh, moved the opium. They tried, I think they tried to set it up in Mexico, but it didn't work. You know, they didn't have the right climate for it, but, or the way, way, anyway, so they moved it to Afghanistan. Well, not only that, but I mean, this is the consequence of heroin. I think the Mexican government told, told the CIA, heck no, we don't want this junk here, because this is what it does to the people, to the young men. It's really, really a, um, you know, a stupefier, and it's chemical warfare that these poor young men are destroying themselves. And it's a spectator thing here. It says, heroin users beneath the Puli Sancta Bridge and observers above. See, these guys are above. Afghanistan has one of the world's highest rate of opiate use. So we went in there to Afghanistan to establish these opium fields. You know, the uh, Taliban quit uh, growing opium there, and that's right when we invaded next. You know, we came up with this boogeyman, Osama bin Laden. You know, we're going to go chase after him. And apparently they have a lot of um, 
um, rare earth minerals in Afghanistan too. But of course, you know, we've got Iraq, you know, we ruin that place and there's always bad stories about that. Well, here's a bad story and this has to do with, with Christianity. And um, yeah, I don't, you've never seen this, but I've, I've done something similar to this. These are um, Iraqis worshiping during a Christmas Eve service at the Sacred Heart Catholic Church in Baghdad. Today, there are fewer than 400,000 Christians living in Iraq, and this was written, uh, well, around Christmas time. But I think here's what I zoomed in on. And, um, in uh, 2003, when the Americans invaded, there were an estimated 1.5 million Christians living in Iraq. Today, experts say there are fewer than 400,000, many of them on the run from the Islamic State. You know, it's like, you know, I mean, who, you know, we, they, it, it's like, it's hard to understand why we went in, into Libya. I mean, Gaddafi was a real good guy. He believed in eliminating money. I think that that's going to be one of the, biggest problems for Hillary, hopefully. I hope our news media asks her, you know, what the hell did we go in there for? I mean, look how bad it is now. You know, all the destruction. You know, Libya, Gaddafi was really concerned for the people, and he used his petroleum wealth to, you know, make things good for the people. And, um, you know, he held everything in check. Same with uh, um, that guy... Um, Saddam Hussein, you know, it's like the problem with, and that's what that new American century thing discussed. They discussed, you know, starting a new Pearl Harbor in order to to fight Israel's wars. And Israel has already done some treachery to the United States when, in uh, during, just before the Six Day War, uh, they sent down one of these intelligence ships, the USS Liberty, uh, over to um, off the coast of Egypt and uh, to allegedly just spy and listen to hear what's going on. And, but the real reason was it was a setup and the Israelis came out and, with, and they even had the insignias. They didn't try to hide it. And so they came out and they napalmed the USS Liberty and they used these heat-seeking missiles to destroy their radio gear. And because the radio gears use these transformers, you have to generate a lot of energy to produce these radio waves to broadcast. And that's what this ship was. It was like a highly sophisticated uh, listening device ship. And I guess you need to have high transformers to boost the pickup on these microphones. No, that's not how they did it. <laughs> it was all wireless, I think. But anyway... They weren't listening with ears like that. They were doing other things. But they could have been. They could have been listening for bombs. I don't know. But I think it had to do with the Golan Heights. You know, the Israel stole that and they stole the Sinai Peninsula. But the whole point was the Israelis were napalming and uh, heat-seeking missiles and and they were shooting their guns. And uh, I don't know if they had those badass guns like these A-10s have down here in Tucson where they have, like, so many bullets go out a, a second, you know, and just, just you don't want to be in their way, you know, those warthogs. But they um, tried to sink the USS Liberty, and and um, there was, I don't know, like 26 killed and, and like, 147 wounded. Here it is. I got a bumper sticker. Uh, 171 wounded, 34 killed. And um, this is... Um, June 8th, 1967, and um, it was a deliberate um, false flag, and they were trying to blame it on Egypt, And but the problem was they didn't succeed. The, the, one of the radio men there managed to get one of the generators going, one of the um, radio transmitters going, because they had it shut down. They, they Heat-seeking missiles blew up all the ones that were hot, but since they had this one under repair, they had it shut off. So that, that's like miracle number one. And th then miracle number two is the guy managed to fix that thing, and he got an SOS out to like the Seventh Fleet out there, and they were going to send some aircraft. And John's McCain dad was involved in covering up, you know. So and Johnson, 
you know, President Johnson was like a real big friend of Israel, and Kennedy wasn't. Kennedy didn't want the Israelis to have uh, nuclear weapons. You know, they were supposed to sign a non-proliferation treaty or something, you know, but they went ahead after they killed Kennedy. There were a lot of reasons for them to want to kill Kennedy, you know, but the people that actually did it were like anti-Castro Cubans. And um, they probably, you know, they were in the CIA. The, I've shown you those pictures of E. Howard Hunt and Frank Sturgis that they looked like some of these bums that were arrested out back of the uh, grassy knoll where they had this railroad trains going by and these guys jumped into a gondola car one of the radio, one of the um, switchmen who was sitting up in a tower named Lee Bowers saw these tramps. There was three tramps. There's one of the tramps, and then there's a picture of the other tramp. And then here's a picture of E. Howard Hunt, and there's another picture of E. Howard Hunt, and there's a picture of Frank Sturgis. And these two guys were friends. They were Watergate buddies. And so these pictures of the tramps were taken like and that that's part of the question in this book here that I've got is you know I'm trying to do a little bit more research now I've got this book by a guy named uh, A.J. Weberman, Alan J. Weberman, Alan Jules Weberman and it's called The Oswald Code and um, he, it's you know I bought it because you know I, he has a website and uh, and this guy's like uh, one of these radical Jews, you know, he doesn't like Holocaust deniers, but he's right about this uh, Kennedy assassination. You know, he had a book called, uh, that he wrote with this guy named Canfield, um, and Canfield and Weberman called the Coup d'etat in America, and that's the book I found out about it. You know, I was going up to the university here and uh, read books about Pol Pot in Cambodia, and just around the corner from those books were the Kennedy assassination books, and I just saw big letters, Coup d'etat in America, on the spine of this book, and I said, oh, wow, well, everybody knows that the Oswald killed Kennedy, you know, and, you know, I wasn't aware of conspiracy theories. How, my, my big thing back then was that, you know, I was aware of the population bomb, and, um, I was aware of uh, limits to growth. You know, limits to growth was like 1973, and the population bomb, I don't know if it was 68 or so, but my mom had the book and, um, and paperback, and I asked her, what does this mean, you know? And she explained it to me, and I don't know, I don't remember, I, should, I want to get the paperback and find out if it has one of those graphs, like, you know, like the hockey stick, where, you know, the exponential growth the, uh, of um, the uh, population, it you can see that you know that it's just in in when my before my dad was born, it was like two two billion people, and then it it's more than doubled, tripled, and you can see it's less gone crazy in in seven in 1776 there was only one billion people, you know it was the wild wild west and. And then here's the um, population projections for the United States. You know, we've got all these, this is immigrants. If we didn't allow all these illegals to come through, then um, our population would go like that. But we're not doing that. And here's, this is 2090 with 600 million people. And I remember when I was growing up, you know, 600 million, that was the population of China. You know, and I think there was, I think the population of the United States was like 125 million. Now it's like 350 million or something. And anyway, this guy that wrote this Oswald book, and um, I thought that he would have a little bit more, and he says he did, about the, um, uh, what the heck is, oh yeah. See now, my theory is that there was two sets of tramps, because a lot of people in the Kennedy assassination uh beliefs and I think you know the important thing is to focus on these tramps you know it's like what's the chances of a l person who looks just like E. Howard Hunt and another one who looks just like Frank Sturgis showing up behind there but the police reports that you know they have a pic the, the police were escorting the three tramps over to the jail to be booked for on suspicion of murder some of them were and the others were just booked on 
drunkenness and hopping freights and stuff. So there was two sets of tramps. And uh, anyway, I was, they have some police reports and there's like two, you can read them and see that one set of tramps were cursing at the police and refusing to get out of the gondola car. And so one of the sh sheriffs that arrested him had to pump a shell into the shotgun and it's in the police report. And uh, the other police reports, plus they interviewed the other guys, they're allegedly just bums and they've interviewed them. And everybody says, oh, those guys are just so nice, you know, they're really good, nice and good. And they, those guys never report about any, any cop jacking a shell in there. And why would a cop lie about that? In fact, there's some police reports and I haven't found them, but I have read them and seen them. I just don't remember where I did, but they have um, evidence that... Um, that the, the three tramps were about to be given a paraffin test to see if any of them shot any weapons. And then they announced that they allegedly caught the murderer who was Lee Harvey Oswald. And I don't know how they could figure that out so quick. I can't remember, you know, because my main focus on the Kennedy assassination is these three tramps. And uh, that guy, uh, even E. Howard Hunt's son, you know, the, um, has come out, and E. Howard Hunt made a, a deathbed convent, confession, but Hunt, I can't remember if Hunt, like, tried to blame uh, Lyndon Johnson. There's a lot, There's another faction in the Kennedy assassination buffs who like to think that, you know, Johnson had something to do with it, and I'm sure he did. You know, it's like almost every president that we've elected has had something to do with, with the Kennedy assassination, except for Jimmy Carter. Uh, like um, Gerald Ford was on the Warren Commission, Ronald Reagan was on the uh, Rockefeller Commission on, on CIA activities in the United States in 1975. <clears throat> and then, uh, of course, George Bush Sr. was head of the CIA, and he was also involved with the anti-Castro Cubans. In fact, one of the two ships that were supposed to cover for the invasion of Cuba. One of them was named after Bush's wife and the other was named after his mother or something like that, you know, I mean. And there's, there was a good article in, in the Nation magazine and I think I mentioned it in my little brochure here. Um, I can't I don't know if it, it's worthy of mentioning who wrote it or not, but it was a big two-page story in the, uh, the Nation magazine, which was you know, the the left-wing intellectual magazine to read back then. But um, they asked, where was Bush, you know, during this, uh, uh, um, you know, the Kennedy assassination. But And they tried to nail that guy, uh, E. Howard Hunt, you know, when they, they brought him before the Rockefeller Commission, they, and um, they they concluded that Dick Gregory uh, influenced his representative. I can't remember who it was. And so the representative gave this information and to this commission to investigate. And they never, that 1975 commission that Ronald Reagan was on never published these pictures. So, like, you know, we've had all these commissions, the Rockefeller Commission, the Warren Commission, the 9-11 Commission, and they've all been covering up the truth, you know, and so my movie, the one that I was, want, I need to pitch it to somebody like, uh, like uh, that guy um, that did the, the Mad Max movies, Gibson, yeah, and I want to pitch to him the idea of um, somebody telling the whole truth, you know, we'd get, like, there's this guy named Talbot who wrote a really good book, you know, like, if the CIA killed JFK, then, you know, I mean, is Robert Kennedy stupid? I mean, you know, he was head of the attorney general's office. And so, I mean, did, I mean, did, didn't he think, uh-oh, I wonder who this guy really is? You know, who is this Saran Saran and, and what story? You know, or did they buy the story that this guy was a Palestinian and he didn't want Israel to get airplanes or something and so he killed Kennedy? I mean, that's ridiculous. I mean, you know, uh, Kennedy didn't want Israel to have nuclear weapons, you know, but, but I, I don't know about airplanes, but like I said, later on, they uh, did that uh, USS Liberty affair, you know, so 
you know, uh, they had to get rid of Kennedy, and uh, and so they did. And then they put Johnson in, and Johnson got the talk and golf thing, you know. And Dick Cheney made a lot of money off the wars, and uh, you know, uh, selling us these wars. And that guy Kissinger, you know, he lied, and they they were bombing Cambodia. They had these B-52s, and they dropped their bombs, and it would just blow out like I don't know how many acres, you know. And they were trying to destroy the supply lines to the south, from the north to the south, and uh, it was one of the reasons that Nixon got impeached. But uh, so you know, they've they've always been um, after they lost that Golden Triangle, and there was also there also oil. There's oil off the coast of. Uh, Vietnam, and I think China is trying to fight for it now. They've got those those islands over there, the Spratleys, I think they call them, and they're trying to, uh, um, you know, establish their territory so they can get this oil out of there. But actually, you know, it's like if we keep burning up all this carbon, it's going to uh, make the polar ice melt up there and uh, and down there and. And then, like, if this ocean up there gets too hot, and I was showing you that, like, in the Bering Sea, it's already, like, seven and a half degrees above normal there. And and if the Gulf Stream goes up north, but I don't know, you know, these methanes, some places, you know, they're really deep, and it's going to be cold down there. And I don't know if we even have to worry about that. My, my older sister came down to visit, and she's saying that the biggest problem is going to be, you know, we are running out of oil, and... And it's not practical to to make a lot of, of you know, like there's not enough rare earth metals to make all these batteries, and and you can't use a battery to to run a train or drive a tractor or um, and there, it's kind of a finite thing, you know. You can't get any more energy out of these things, and you know, and maybe you know you can't have faith that science is going to make a breakthrough. You know, you've got to have contingency plans. And I just think that it's kind of just like the Earth. You know, it was a miracle that the Earth formed, and it took a lot of contingencies in order to make life here. You know, the great oxygenation event, and being just the right distance from the sun, and like even right in, you know, these other things, like you have to have a moon, and of course you have to have water. And um, so, you know, it's a miracle we're here, and I don't believe that there's other life on other planets because it's just such a miracle. You know, there's a book called Rare Earth by Brownlee and somebody else, but, um, and I've got it on my website, but you know, it's kind of hard to find. And I think I call it Rare Earth, and I list all the contingencies. And then you look at this, the life, you know, it started out like, you know, with sponges, and then, you know, after billions of years, it took like three billion years for a, for a single cell to form, you know, and and they still never really figured out what caused it to form. They think maybe something from outer space landed, like a fungus or something. I don't know, but, you know, that's all speculation. But, like, you know, you look at some of these animals, you know, and you just think, wow, you know, that's such a trip, you know, and and we're, you know, making them go extinct or infer, infringing on their territory, you know, and things like that. And we don't design these cities very ecologically either. And so, you know, but like these wars, you know, they, they're just like, uh, this is in Syria, you know, that's like, you know, that movie <clears throat> where those, um, what do they call those guys, the ISIS characters, they burnt that journalist alive in a cave. And I think today or tomorrow is the anniversary of Dresden, you know, uh, during World War II, the British dropped fire bombs on there, you know, people were fried alive in their basements down there, you know. And, and so one person was deliberately set on fire in a cage, you know, and that creates a lot of outrage. And I think those guys drove that point through because in that same video, and I didn't look at it, you know, I didn't look at the whole thing, but, you know, you're having your city destroyed like this. And these guys in that video were like sitting high on a top, on a pile of, of debris, um, Here's another picture in Syria of of this devastation, and um, and the, this article it even says you know that these the people that live there allegedly they um, 
they uh, they still believe, you know, that you know we gotta stop this ISIS, you know, and um, you know it's kind of like you know you know it's like if you lived in a society like that. And I was, I saw this article today on the news. They're saying you know since there's so many Muslims, I don't know if it was England or France, they've closed a lot of these ta ta uh, taverns. You know they've you know the British like to sit around and take it easy and you know have a beer and things like that but you know the these Muslims you know they're you know that's you know I mean being healthy is a good thing you know the Mormons believe in being healthy and stuff and you know alcohol and tobacco certainly isn't a very good thing and there was a new story here um, saying that tobacco is worse than than they thought you know I haven't read it yet I was just going mad tearing all this stuff out because I was behind reading reading these papers it says that smoking's toll on health is even worse than previously thought a study finds. So I haven't read it, but, you know, it's just another incentive to um, stop. And here's a picture of this. I thought, oh, wow, maybe, you know, this is like uh, um, what my friend um, Dr. Nis Newtopia would call uh, arcology. You know, it looks, oh, wow, look how smart that is. You know, it's a nice big place. And then here you can see, you know, there's people are living pretty packed together, it looks like. And then there's farmlands over here. I can't tell. Yeah, I guess that is. But if, if, if you, you know, I try to zoom in here and give you an idea. These are like apartment blocks, you know. They're like four stories high. And you can kind of see the little rat trails they've made through there. There's no way to park a car there, so everybody has to commute. I don't know. I don't see where the commuting. Oh, there, there it looks like they got a big freeway running through there. But I don't, maybe they'll catch a bus. I don't know, it's 16,000 16, people live in this in this um, area here. They don't have a scale. Oh, there it is. That's 1,000 feet. So let's see, there's 1,000, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. So that's about, that's about uh, oh, not quite a mile, like two kilometers. Uh, let's zoom out again. And then you can see over here, they show you what these places where these immigrants, you know, and uh, things like that live. You know, there's like this big um, to do about, you know, them drawing these pictures of Muhammad. I don't know how to describe them, you know, it's kind of silly, you know, I mean, but, you know, and they're making fun of Muhammad. I don't blame them, you know, I mean. Of all the religions, I think this Islamic religion is probably the most irrational. You know, Jesus was the logos or logic of God. It says that in John 1.1. 1, 1. That's another one of those words they don't translate correctly. If you look up the word logic, you'll see that, that Jesus is the logos or logic of God. And, um, you know, the truth will rise again. And the sayings of Jesus, you know, like I said, he's a radical. And it's most of it's practical advice and you know, you have faith that can move mountains and, you know, you can you can do it. You know, it's kind of like a pep talk. And, you know, I don't even know if Jesus existed or not, you know, but, you know, he had some pretty good teachings. I thought this was a pretty interesting map. You know, it, it shows our history, and I didn't know it was this bad. But they, this is a map showing all the lynchings. And uh, let's see how many they say they had. Um... 73 years of lynchings, it says. And uh, I should have had that underlined, you know. But here, this big circle, that shows where the 243, 237 people were lynched in 1919 during the Olane race riot in Arkansas. So um, that's, you know, our history. Don't, where is it? Why don't they tell you? I guess, you know, I didn't read this article, um, but in one year they had, um, is that a five-year total? Let's see, or is this five years? Lynchings every five years. There's zero, zero, five. Yeah, so maybe 600 people over five years. It's kind of a, but anyway, that's part of our history. And and um, here's something I thought was kind of strange. They've had um, this artwork sold for $30 million. It shows where our priorities are, you know. It's like these people, these rich people, you know, kind of, you know, it just 
I look at the news, and they had this, like, on the front page of the New York Times on Sunday. They were telling you that the um, they have these people buying these condominiums and, um, in New York City, and some of these buildings, up to 77% are bought by, like, real rich people, like these Russian oligarchs that made all the money after Yeltsin got in there. In fact, here's some pictures of them. And, you know, they're paying, like, millions of dollars for these condominiums, like $15 million, and they're buying them under these shell companies. You know, it's like, you know, maybe they know that, you know, it's going to hit the fan soon, and they, they want to get out of Russia, and so they're all going to come down here and live in these towers of Babylon here, towers in Babylon. And uh, so you've got um, things like that, and then you've got a picture of men trying to get into Egypt from the Gaza Strip. You know, the Gaza Strip is like a concentration camp, and uh, those people were terrorized in order to leave. You know, these, the, these people aren't God's chosen people. That's a, a falsification because God's people don't lie, you know, and they... They lied about this Holocaust. They lied about this 9-11 thing. They lied about Kennedy assassination. And they lied about what the mark of the beast is and what mammon is. And, and so they, the devil is a liar. He's a slanderer. And if you look up the etymology of the word devil, you'll see what I'm saying. And they even accused Jesus of being possessed by a devil. You know, And they crucified the truth. They killed the messenger. And uh, so my movie would have a person that would tell the truth about all this stuff, you know, and it would, the disciples would back it up, you know, they'd say, oh yes, you know, we'd have some historians on there, and, you know, it would be like a truth and reconciliation uh, committee like they had to do in South Africa, you know, and, uh, and that's, you know, I mean, that's how, that's the only way that we're going to be able to continue like this, you know, we have finite resources here, and not only that, but, you know, this invisible pollution is causing the earth to warm up and it's creating all kinds of crazy weather patterns. You know, there's drought in California and uh, in Brazil. I've got an article here. This great big city in Brazil, they've got like uh, 28 million people. How many people are there? 20 million people live in this Sao Paulo, Brazil. And uh, they're going to end up, uh, this was the end of January. It's just getting worse now. Look at that, it's down to, they don't even know what they're going to do, you know, and there was an article, I think, in the Daily Star the other day, you know, I read it online, and uh, they're saying, you know, it's like, you know, the Anasanis who lived in this area, like, two, two not 2,000, but just, I think, 800 years ago, maybe, you know, they suddenly had to move out, you know, they, you know, there's a drought, and they dried up all the rivers around there, you know, and this um, Hoover Dam, you know, I always go up there, Lake Powell, you know, and the, the article was saying that all these rains we've had hasn't helped the, the water basin around here. It hasn't helped in Colorado either, and, you know, only a miracle is going to save these people down there in uh, Sao Paulo, you know, like, I, I read that this, the Coca-Cola company, you know, the, to produce all those glass bottles takes a lot of water, and they use a lot of water to make this, those concoctions. But, you know, I guess in a lot of those places, especially like in Mexico, where they use real sugar in it, they, uh, you have to um, drink something, you know. Um, but a lot of those people down there are immune to, you know, the bad water. But, like, imagine if, if Tucson, you know, if things really get bad here and our, our electricity doesn't work and our, all our food spoils and, and our air conditioners don't work, you know, like last summer is pretty bad, and, and even if we don't have any water, you know, how are you going to cool off? I mean, pretty quickly your swimming pool, you know, if you run out of chlorine, it's going to turn into a stinky mess. So Tucson is one of the worst places to be, and I hope that, you know, maybe this summer I can scout out some place to get out of Babylon. You know, I've lived here since January 1st, 1980, and I've been in the jail here, and I've been ripped off in the court here, and... You know, I, I think it's just maybe time to move on and learn something else. But I'm so glad to be able to speak to you tonight and have the facilities of Access Tucson produce my movies all these years. 
God bless. Peace and love. See you later. Bye.